Uh, I would like to start by echoing the words of Paul to the elect in Ephesus, to you, the pupils of Providence. For I ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Amen. Well, what I stand before you to proclaim today is nothing new, because as King Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. In fact, you've probably heard a lot of it before, but my concern isn't really with whether you've heard it before or not, but with whether you heed it or not. Uh, last week, while I was in Virginia completing my visa application for my, what is now my seventh missionary journey, you guys were blessed in chapel to hear from the, the Vintons, I believe it was their name. Um, and what, what they really spoke about was how their, their main method of sharing the light of the Father of Lights with the people there was building schools around the country so that the children would not have to remain in the darkness of ignorance. So in effect, they're continuing the tradition of great missionaries throughout history. The Vintons are using education to open doors for the gospel. My favorite missionary, a guy by the name of Matteo Ricci from Italy, he used math and map making to do the same thing in China. Peter, the fisherman, was known as a fisher of men. The Ethiopian, once saved, shared the gospel with others in a diplomatic way. Luke was a physician. Cornelius the centurion considered it his mission to lead his family and the servants of his household to the Lord via Peter. And Lydia the businesswoman helped finance missions of the great early missionaries. Finally, the one called Saul the Pharisee became known as Paul the tent maker. In Paul's three major missionary ex expeditions, he had some tearful times, he had some testing times, but ultimately, he was able to be triumphant because he stayed the course. By his own account, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, three times he was beaten with rods. Three times he was shipwrecked. And he was constantly on the move. So what can we learn from Paul's example? Well, I would say that life is a journey. As believers, life is a journey with a mission. And we are to always be on the move with the gospel. And Paul experienced this in his own life, but we know that there will be tearful trials. There will be testing times. And the only way to transition through these into triumph is through persevering in prayer, in planning, and in practice. Just as the Apostle Paul in history was a missionary, and the Vintons in modernity are missionaries, I am also a missionary. And as a missionary, you have to be unapologetically transparent in your testimony, exemplifying in words, in deeds, and in love the manifestation of a living epistle. You have to be unashamed of who you are, but you also have to be sensitive to where you are. You have to find your gifts, you have to be faithful in your prayers, and you have to face your fears. At a young age, I found out that my gift was soccer. And so now my mission field is the soccer field. My mission has taken me at this point to countries such as France, the Dominican Republic, Slovenia, Israel, Bolivia, the Netherlands, and now Ireland. And I've been called to share Jesus with professional soccer players in Europe, which I believe is one of the most neglected, unreached people groups in the modern world. Perhaps part of the reason for this neglect is that because they're professional soccer players, their competitive mindset kind of keeps them from listening to anybody who can't do what they can do. So my job is to be so excellent at my craft and so different in my lifestyle and so radical in my love for them that they cannot help but ask for the reason for the hope that is in me. The scripture verses that were read earlier were chosen because they kind of track my journey thus far as a soccer missionary. For example, Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 3, 
was about being obedient to our parents. Scholars suggest that Paul wrote this epistle to the Ephesians while he was in prison in Rome, around 62 AD. In essence, at the end of his life, one of his final pleas was that we remain obedient to our parents. That's interesting. And in Romans 10, 14 to 15, Paul was speaking about bringing the gospel to other peoples. Well, Paul wrote this, his longest epistle, to the Romans while he was in Corinth about six years earlier. So in essence, while he was encouraging them to share the gospel, he was away doing exactly that. The Ebenezer milestones in my life connect the dots between these two points, between obedience and missions. So I'll share a few of them with you. First off, as a child, and some of you guys might have seen some of these, but I watched Christian TV shows such as Heroes of the Bible, Liberty Kids, and above all, Bible Man. <laughs> I listened to Christian radio dramas such as Adventures in Odyssey, Ranger Bill, and Unshackled. And the importance of these was that the lesson I learned through these stories helped me to prepare for the trials and tests ahead of me in my own life as a missionary. In the first grade, I learned how to pray using the ACTS method. So starting with adoration, moving on to confession, then to thanksgiving, and finally supplication. And I began praying every single day that I would become a professional soccer player in Europe. But I also learned how to plan. See, my parents sat me down at about that age and explained to me that if I wanted to be a professional soccer player in Europe, then there were at least 100, that was a big number for me at that time, at least 100 other kids my same age with the same exact dream. But they would fall off for a variety of reasons, be it girls or drugs or alcohol or laziness. And they explained to me that if I stayed the course, if I remained obedient, then my dreams could become a reality. And they have. And I think something that a lot of kids of all ages, moving into adolescence and then becoming adults, discount is that when they fight their parents, they are in effect fighting their own dreams. In the eighth grade, I dealt with some tearful trials. Uh, raise your hand if you've been bullied before. Anybody? Yeah, a couple. Uh, I was pretty intensely bullied for about a year at a soccer academy that I went to in Ohio. Um, it brought me to tears and it took me a while to get out of that rut. But in our lives, there will be tearful trials. In the 12th grade, I dealt with some testing times. This time the test was of my obedience. See, what I wanted to do after I graduated was immediately go and play professionally in Europe. I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to go to college first because some of my former teammates were going straight to Europe. But my parents, in their wisdom, suggested that first I get my degree. And in retrospect, although I know that at that time I was good enough to get into the system, I also know now that I did not have the mental or spiritual fortitude that I would have needed to succeed at the level that I'm playing at now. And so by obeying my parents, I wound up being su successful again. I was blessed for that. You see, in our lives there will be tearful trials. And there will be testing times. In the 16th grade, my senior year in college, I was able to experience a triumph. I continued my education online um, after I graduated a little early so I could get out as soon as I could. Because so, I told my parents, well, if I, if I have to go, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get out quick. But I started my master's online the next year. Um, I experienced the triumph of being one of only five Americans worldwide to play in the Europa League in 2016. See, the takeaway from that is, in our lives, there will be tearful trials. There will be testing times. And the only way to transition through these into triumph is through persevering in prayer, in planning, and in practice. In the 17th grade, I experienced trial once again. You see, what I learned, which Paul would undoubtedly agree with, is that the trials don't stop after triumph. This time, the trial was an injury. Uh, you saw some clips in that video, the team I was playing with at that time. The pressure at that level was so intense that I was driven to overworking so hard that I actually grew an extra bone in my left foot. Uh, this bone spur 
started to pinch the nerves in my foot to the point where it was so painful I couldn't walk anymore. And uh, at that level, you got to make it happen. So I was a little stressed. I needed surgery, and I was going to lose my spot. But because I was obedient to my parents and still going to church, even though I wasn't in their house anymore, in fact, I wasn't in their country anymore, one Sunday, a prayer team came from Germany led by an Englishman. They laid hands on people after the service. I was one of those people. And although the MRIs and x-rays all say that I still need surgery because the bone is still there and bigger than ever, I have felt no pain since that day. So glory to God for that. As Reverend Jerry Falwell famously said, in life you are either in the midst of a storm, you are just getting out of a storm, or you are about to go into a storm. But nothing of eternal significance is possible apart from prayer. This means that as Christians, our prayers can never cease. And now I'm in a period of transition. I'm in the 18th grade now, about to graduate with my master's. And I'm moving to another land to start another adventure in the mission field. So I seek your prayers for my mission as I will continue to pray for you all, so that we all, in our respective mission fields, will have the faith to persevere through the upcoming storms, and our witness will have the impact on our respective communities that it needs to have for the kingdom to continue to grow. For our purpose is prepared through planning and practice. It is protected through prayer. And finally, it is completed through perseverance. While he was in the military, my dad had the opportunity to have lunch with Marty King, the son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And during the course of their conversation, Marty King gave a poem to my dad, which he has in turn passed on to me. It's called Life Without Purpose. Life without purpose is barren indeed. There can be no harvest unless you plant seed. There can be no attainment unless there's a goal, and man's but a robot unless there's a soul. You see, if no ships go out, then no ships come in. Unless there's a contest, Nobody can win. There can be no game unless it is played. And prayers can't be answered unless they are prayed. Let's pray.